Hello and a very, very warm welcome, a very good evening to you. I would like to speak about uh, Uspensky's major theory uh, and what it actually means and how we are to actually take it. And as most of us are aware of, most of us know, uh, his major theory is the theory of eternal recurrence. And it seemed to be a, an obsession with him from a very, very early age. And it continued throughout his life into his old age, this obsession with eternal recurrence that I have been here before, that I have lived before. And the two major works in which he outlines it are A New Model of the Universe and the later work, The Fourth Way. And the final, the final chapter of The Fourth Way, chapter 15, is actually dedicated to the theory of eternal recurrence. And the penultimate chapter in A New Model of the Universe is entitled Eternal Recurrence and the laws of Manu, and it's also expounded within that chapter. And it's basically what he's saying is that the life that we are now living, we have lived countless times in infinity and everything in it, every moment, me sitting here and you listening, every single moment is repeated in infinity and what he believes is that the moment of our death actually coincide, coincides with the moment of our birth to the same parents so we're born all the clocks stop and we are born to the same parents in the same house we have the same friends we go to the same school we do the, the same jobs we meet the same people and this goes on ad infinitum, in infinity. And it's very, very possible. One cannot deny it. One cannot verify it unless a, an altered state of consciousness is achieved, which he speaks of in the following terms. During each one of these lives, we actually reach a crossroads where some, something happened which we have to make unhappen. We have to prevent it. And, and at that particular moment, we obviously need to ascend into an altered state of consciousness and to see what happened before at that precise moment. And it's, as I say, it's like a crossroads. And normally we keep going one way and we do the same thing over and over again. But when we come to, this, come to this crossroads, we have to remember what happened last time and actually change it. And when we do, if and when we do, we take a different pathway and we go somewhere else. We go into another dimension and we go onto another level of consciousness outside the three-dimensional one. And in doing so, we can actually, once we've done so, I, sh I should say, we can then help others actually escape this trap of eternal recurrence. But the whole point lies in becoming conscious at the moment when whatever happened, happened and changing it. Now, if we truly believe that, do excuse me a moment, we're going through a heat wave in, in sunny London town. But at that precise moment, we change something and we don't recur anymore. It actually gives impetus to life and it gives it a very, very beautiful meaning. So I have been here before, I have done this before, and unless I change it, whatever it was that was undesirable, an, an encounter, an event, unless I change it, I go straight back to my birth and I live the same life over and over again. Nietzsche speaks of this in Thus Spoke Zarathustra, but he doesn't go as far as Uspensky did in actually putting the crossroads in 
whereby one has to become conscious and therefore escape from eternal escape from eternal recurrence. In fact, Nietzsche says the very very famous quote: "As Zarathustra is waking up one morning on top of the mountain, uh, imagine a devil came up to you and said, this life that you live, you will have to live countless times over and over again, and nothing in it will be any different. Everything will be exactly the, the same. Would you tear your hair with grief and say, this is the worst thing I've ever heard? Or would you leap for joy and actually embrace this continual, eternal, eternal, eternal recurrence? Nietzsche called it the heaviest thought and without a way out of that it can be very very paralyzing because one can think well I did this before how on earth can I prevent myself from doing it again and making the same mistake and as we know Uspensky wrote a novel about this The Strange Life of Ivan Ozakin which is, is, is the theory in novel form, and Ozakin makes the same mistake over and over again. But the point is, if this theory is true, not to make the mistake and be taken into another dimension outside of eternal recurrence. And there was a character, incredibly famous, one of the most famous people of his day, and his name, his name was J.B. Priestley, and he, and he lived from 1894 to 1884. Uh, and he wrote some of the most successful, famous plays in the world. And what propelled him to do it was reading Uspensky's A New Model of the Universe, and especially the section on eternal recurrence. And Priestley developed an obsession with Uspensky's theory and it inspired him to write plays and to write essays. And one of his, one of his first successful plays was a play called I Have Been Here Before. And not a lot of people will know of this, but Uspensky is actually dramatized and he's the central character. It's a character called Dr. Gortler, and he's a German doctor who has the power and the ability of precognition, and he can see into the future and ever, everything that's happened before. And as the play opens, it's set in a remote farmhouse on the North Yorkshire Moors. There's a number of couples assembled there for a little get together and a holiday. And out of the blue, from nowhere, Dr. Gortler arrives and he's met with incredulity and surprise. They don't know who he is. He's got a foreign accent. He's very, very different. And Uspensky, uh, Priestley actually puts Uspensky on the stage as Dr. Gortler. And to summarize the play, one of the central couples are having marital, marital difficulties and they sit down one evening with Dr. Gortler and he predicts everything that's going to happen. And the husband is eventually, a couple of days later, going to commit suicide. And he tells them this. And at first, as you wouldn't, they don't believe him. But a day goes by and for some obscure reason, the husband who committed suicide last time actually also has precognition due to what Gortler has actually said to him and he doesn't commit suicide and they go off together happily ever after. That's a play called I Have Been Here Before and all through the play the idea of time and dimensions is toyed with and it's given different aspects and time shifts into, dif into different dimensions in different scenes in the play. It's an astounding play and it was first performed in London in 1937. As I say, the idea was Uspensky's from Eternal Recurrence. And Priestley's most famous... The reason I'm talking about Priestley 
is obviously because he dramatised Uspensky, but also he tried, Priestley tried, to get into Uspensky's London group, and he tried so, so hard, uh, but he never, ever succeeded. And he would sometimes go along to meetings, he was recognisable wherever he went, and the people at the reception wouldn't let him in. And they've, they've said, Mr. Uspensky has wrote to you, uh, you're not welcome at these meetings, please don't come. And he kept turning up for maybe half a dozen times uh, and then stopped going altogether. And the reason Uspensky gave was that J.B. Priestley was so incredibly, incredibly famous uh, that it was the last thing that the Fourth Way Group wanted. Because if it had gone to the meeting, the press would have been there, it would have been splashed over the newspapers the following day, and the group didn't want this to happen. And Priestley actually never got over it. And he spent in his autobi autobiography, he writes uh, that it was the biggest regret of his life, the biggest cause of upset, that he was denied, denied access to Uspensky's groups. And as I say, Priestley became incredibly famous. And in 1945, he released uh, his most famous play, which I'm sure that everyone has heard of, and it's called An Inspector Calls. And it's also set on the theme of eternal recurrence and of time shifts. And in, in a nutshell, it's set in 1910, and it's a very, very wealthy, upper-middle-class English family who are industrialists and they own all these factories and so on, called the Berlin family. And they're sitting having dinner one evening, there's about six of them, six of them gathered there, and there's a knock on the door, and it's an inspector from the police station, and he says to them, uh, I, I'm here because a young woman has just died in the mortuary from suicide, and you all know her. And they're absolutely horrified. The Berlin family are horrified and the lady's name was Eva Smith. And each member of the Berlin family had had a tragic connection with her. First of all, she'd worked for Mr. Berlin's factory and she'd formed a union and demanded wage increases and he sacked her. And then she went to work in a department store and the wife of, sorry, the daughter of Mr. Berlin went there one day to buy a very, very expensive dress. And it didn't particularly, particularly look good on, good on her. So she asked the shop assistant, who was Eva Smith, to try the dress on. And Eva was very, very beautiful, and she looked great in the dress. And this Miss Berlin woman became very, very annoyed and very spiteful and jealous. And because she was so incredibly wealthy, she asked the manager to sack Eva. So Eva had gone from the factory where she'd been sacked by the father of the family to being sacked from the department store by the daughter of the owner of the factory. And the final straw, one evening in a local pub having a drink, she met a very, very handsome young man and they started a relationship. And he was the son of Gerald Berlin, the head of the family. And he said to her, I will provide for you, I will buy you a home, I will make a very, very good life for you, and everything will be, will be fine. And he got her pregnant and then abandoned her. And she was just left with child, completely abandoned. So that was the son who'd actually abused her. And the final, final straw, she goes to a charitable organisation which is run by the wife of Gerald Berlin, and she's refused help because they say that she's not doing enough to look for work, and she's young, she's able, it doesn't matter that she's having a child, she's not working hard enough, we're not going to help you. And then the shit hit the fan, and she took her life. And the inspector was interrogating them all about what had happened, and they, they were obviously uh, totally devastated. They didn't, didn't know what to do. And at the end of the evening, the inspector said to them, we all have a, a personal and a, a social responsibility 
to other people and let us think about our actions before we do them. And he wandered off. He, he, he left the house and the family were in dismay. And the father said, I'm going to phone the police station because I've never heard of this person. Who is this? His name was Inspector Gould. And it's like a, a, a pun or a twist, a twist on ghoul, as in ghost. And he phones the police station, he says, an Inspector Ghoul has been here. Uh, can you give me some information about him? I don't know who he is. And the police station say he doesn't, he doesn't exist. Uh, there's no one here by that name at the police station. It, it's, an, it's an imposter, it's been a hoax. And the family are relieved. But not totally, because what he said about what they had done to this Ava Smith was absolutely right. And about 10 minutes later, they're sitting quietly around the table and the doorbell rings and Mr. Burling goes to the door and it's a police inspector. And he says, about 20 minutes ago, a young woman by the name of Eva Smith was found dead in the local mortu mortuary She'd taken her life. I've come to ask you some questions. And the curtain falls. And when the play was premiered, it caused a sensation. And a couple of years after it's a London premiere, Hollywood made it into a movie, uh, which was highly successful. So we had this first scene of the inspector who didn't exist, who had stepped outside of a time continuum. And then when they think it's OK, another one comes along with exactly the same story in this cycle of eternal recurrence. And J.B. Priestley got, got all the acclaim for his theory of eternal recurrence, and Uspensky got none. It was literally lifted out of a new model of the universe uh, and what he'd read of Uspensky. There weren't his ideas at all. Uh, he just lifted them and used them himself. And he never gave credit to Uspensky. So I suppose the karma is that he was not admitted to the fourth way groups and they wouldn't allow him entrance and so on. But I think it's quite a, an incredible story how things sort of sync together. And the theory of time Gurdjieff refer refers to it as the merciless hero pass is, is something which is extraordinary, is an understatement. On a very practical level, 20 years of my life, maybe 25, have gone in what appear to be five minutes. It go Once you hit your mid-30s, it goes like five minutes. It's like someone's pressed the fast forward button. And it just, you, one day you're 35 and before you know where you are, you're 50. And it's like, whoa, what happened? But we don't, as Uspensky stated in the two works I've just mentioned, we don't exist in time. We exist outside of it in another dimension. But ironically, we are also part of passing time. And through work upon ourselves, we can actually become not part of passing time, but part of a vertical line that's going through the horizontal line of passing time, which is the eternal moment. But the idea of, I spoke about this in an audio a couple of years ago, the idea of actually becoming conscious at that moment when you do something which spoils your life uh, is the ultimate. And I, I first became aware of it 20, 25 years ago, and it's played a very, very large part in my life. Just being aware that one can change one's recurrence by choosing a different action. And when we do the fourth way work and we make progress and we advance within the work, little changes are made every day and they eventually become very, very big changes. And the more we work on ourselves, with the more we can work within this construct of, of the time continuum and actually come out of it at some stage uh, into another dimension. And that would be, or is, 
truly extraordinary to be able to do that. There's a, there's a temperature thing in the corner over there and it's currently about 87 degrees. Very, very nice, my personal sauna. Hugh Spensky. And as we know, the last few years of his life were, spelled, were spent in the countryside in, in a remote house uh, called Lime Place. And he was taken out at two o'clock, two o'clock in the morning. <clears throat> he was very, very nocturnal. And he was driven around the English countryside, a countryside for a few hours. And people said, well, people said, why are you doing this? And he said, it's to remember next time, next time I come back. It's impossible to get one's normal way of thinking around that, that you actually go back to the place in time where you were born and exactly the same things happen to you. And at some point, if you become conscious, you can actually change them. This is, a, this is in total an utter contrast to Gurdjieff's theory of we don't have a soul. And our purpose here in life through conscious suffering and paying for the cause of our arising is to create a soul. And by creating a soul, we create a Kestian body, an astral body, which once the planetary body decomposes, becomes eternal within the within the solar system. So you have two theories there. You have Uspensky's of eternal recurrence and you have Gurdjieff's of if you don't create the soul, you go back to dust. But within all contradictions, there is a harmony and a wholeness. They can be both brought together and they can be harmonized both theories, Uspensky's and Gurdjieff's. And I have this belief, and I've kept it till the very, very end, uh, that Gurdjieff and Uspensky never separated, that it was a huge smokescreen, so that they could work in absolute privacy and actually do exactly what they wanted to do behind closed doors. I don't, two men who were on telepathic levels at Esantuki, and who shared so much of such a deep level couldn't uh, dissever from one another. It's impossible. I don't believe they ever did separate. And there's so much in what we read, whether it's in In Search of the Miraculous, whether it's um, meetings with remarkable men that's actually written in between the lines, which we don't see for the main part. And I've been thinking over the last few days, there is something in the work which is inexpressible. And I have a, a friend that I work with and she keeps saying, whatever you cannot imagine, that it will be. And to me, that's what the work is. It's what the fourth way work is. It's what life is. Uh, life is miraculous. And what we cannot imagine that is what the work is and will be. And what is it what we cannot imagine? Impossible to say, because it's on a different, it's on a different level altogether. Uh, thank you very much for watching and have wherever you are, have a very, very nice evening. And, uh, that was just a little talk about J.B. Priestley and P.D. Uspensky and their obsessions with eternal recurrence. Deja vu is, is a common term and it's more or less a similar thing that you've actually done it before and you, you just repeated it over and over again. But that moment, just a single moment of, of, of becoming conscious and seeing it. And in a further record of meetings uh, by Uspensky, he's referred to by the people in the audience as a medium, as a psychic medium, a psychic medium. And I believe that's exactly what he was. 
and he saw so many things uh, which he didn't communicate, he kept them to himself for whatever reason. Thank you very much for watching. Bye for now.